Hi, I'm Jalen Jones. I'm the creator and owner of Redefine Your Limits, an in-home personal training experience designed directly towards your body. In this episode of Brave Talks, I speak with Jalen Jones, owner and founder of Redefining Your Limits. Jalen is a personal trainer, renowned track athlete, and dear friend to both myself and my husband. Jalen holds a Bachelor's of Science in Exercise Physiology and is NASM certified personal trainer, nutrition coach, and corrective exercise specialist. In this conversation, Jalen and I share about our journeys through body dysmorphia and the redemptive mind, heart, soul, and body resets that helped us recover and find power in the truth. Strength is not a size. Thanks for coming on the show, Jalen. I'm so, so lucky to have you in my life, not only because you are the trainer for Matt and I, but also because you feel like a brother to me and a family member. And we've had so many shared experiences. In fact, Matt, we were in, um, we were hiking in the mountains in North Carolina, I guess last summer. And he was like, I'm going to start with this trainer when we get back to Miami. But meanwhile, he's sending me these workouts. And I was like, oh, another trainer. Great. And uh, so positive, Emily. Really great. Slow clap. And then he kept going to you. And I was like, okay, well, out of desperation for time to myself, I was like, I, I want to go to the trainer too. When I showed up and told you, um, we had our first conversation. You're like, what are, you, what are your goals? And I was like, well, my goal is to just show up. I think it was that simple is to just like be here now. And, you know, through the course of our relationship, we started opening ourselves up and sharing ourselves immediately. There was no shame or judgment. Um, We were both college athletes, division one athletes, and both experienced extreme adversity and extreme injury. And on top of all of that, we experienced extreme body dysmorphia, eating disorders, as a female, as a male athlete. And I was like, Jalen, we have to share this when you're ready. You know, training didn't, all of a sudden it, it, um, transformed from this, you know, external look at me, like I'm here to get a six pack ab type of scenario to one of self-compassion by working with you through these, emotional and physical challenges and overcoming them together. It has been so powerful. We're here today to talk about strength, not being a size. And this has been something we routinely talk about and how strength doesn't necessarily come always come from your physical body. But as you say, it's something that occurs when you show up every single day for yourself out of love, not out of self-hate or doubt, but out of love. And so do you want to talk a little bit about your philosophy on health and well-being and showing up for yourself every day? Correct. Of course, of course. First off, I do say thank you for having me here and thank you for that amazing intro that you kind of just bestowed upon us all here. Thank you for that. It's been a blessing to be able to work and actually be able to grow with you and Matt and actually understand how Ali is as well to see him grow up through the times that we sit together. Uh, as well with that, yeah, understanding that I think people, there's such a big stigmatism around health and wellness being more so of a number rather than understanding how to understand how to take care of your body, mind, body, and soul, and letting the body, the out pro- the outlook of it, and actually the, the visual representation of it be a byproduct. Um, I think that's where everyone kind of goes wrong in a way. They think that it's like, okay, I'm going to look like this by the time that I'm done with this. Well, how about to go back, reset the process, and actually go through and understand that it's not about how you're looking, more so about how you're feeling first. And if you can take on that kind of a concept and a mindset and say, okay, I'm going to the gym today to get better and better my mindset, better my mental, better my well-being, better my skin, things like that, rather than say, okay, I want the eight-pack, or I want the six-pack, or I want the nice glutes, or the nice back. I'm going to get rid of this. Feel better about yourself first. And I think if you can kind of bestow that kind of message upon people, then that's where the mindset kind of switches and it flips in that. That's been my philosophy of learning my trial and through my, throughout my trial and tribulations through college, through everything I've gone through, which, of course, we'll get into that has kind of become to be my message of what I want to get across. Uh, Understanding how to take care of your body first, rather than being say, okay, I want to look like this. Let's take a step back. I feel like every one of my clients like a Rubik's Cube. And when they come to me, my job is to get every single one of those lines that Rubik's Cube matched up. But guess what? Along that journey, if I do get it there, 
I know that something's going to flip back to where it was before. So I have the conscience to be on my toes to kind of keep guiding you along the journey because guess what? Rome was not built overnight. Trust the journey, enjoy the process, and the product will follow. So let's talk about your journey. As an athlete, college athlete, tell me what it was like experiencing body dysmorphia and being a super track star and training for the U.S. team. And like, give me the the behind the scenes camera on your head, like visual of what it was like, the truth of it. Because I don't I don't think there's enough stories of men having these experiences out there. A hundred percent. I even take you back to the beginning of it and kind of relaying back to where you said uh, when we first met and how open we were with each other. I think it was maybe our third time training to where when you were who were another one of our clients that were training a group session, we were talking about body dysmorphia in men. And I'm thinking to myself, like, okay, if these women have the, like, have the strength to talk about this in front of me, then let me at least let me tell my story. So, therefore, we can kind of get the ball rolling and to make sure, like, whoa, well, it's not just women that deal with it. Yes, men deal with it as well. So, that was, like, the first kind of stepping stone for us to kind of opening up and peeling back the layers to kind of keep allowing us to gravitate and grow our energy and our relationship together. So that base bone right there, now going back to college. Coming to college, uh, of course, I was thankfully to be a high-caliber athlete, got recruited to the University of Miami. Um, I had no signs of whether it be body dysmorphia or anything. I always thought that my eating, my eating was the best thing out there. I never thought anything was wrong with it. Until you get to the next level of Division One or D2, wherever the case may be, um, you're, you're kind of held to a higher caliber and higher standard to where everything is nitpicked to the, like the very minimal aspect of it. And when you're kind of held up to a certain level, you want to accrue to that. And you want to always stand to that, that, that level. So coming into my sophomore year, uh, I would have coaches that would always come back and forth and say, hey, you're gaining weight here, you're gaining weight there. And me thinking in the back of my head, I'm like, there's no way that I'm gaining weight, no possible way. I, like, I'm a high-caliber athlete. And especially to the normal eye, you may think that five pounds on an athlete is like that's nothing. But to us, one pound to a half a pound matters more than people may think it does. And if you can kind of put yourself in our kind of viewpoint, that's where things kind of really start to unfold for me. And it got to the point where I realized that I would eat, and not even 30 minutes after I was done eating, I would go and purge. I would ask my girlfriend at the time, who actually is my girlfriend now, can I step away from the table, or can I go to the bathroom really quickly? And she'll wonder, where am I going? What's going on with you? Of course, we'll go to the bathroom, purge, not realizing what I was doing to my body. And I think over time, that became to be the repetition and the ritual for me. I would say at least three times a week, maybe twice a day. I would eat, although I would know that the foods I would be consuming were not the best foods for me, I would still go in and do it day in and day out. And constantly hearing that same repetition that my college coach is saying, hey, you're picking up weight here, you're picking up weight there. And it actually got to the point to where I would meal prep every Sunday and Wednesday to take my food to school. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, I would have two tilapias for lunch and dinner. Monday, Wednesday through Friday, I can literally tell you the, the meal plan to the T. And that became so habitual for me that I realized that my food, my relationship with food now was starting to actually become a hindrance upon me because everything was so detailed to the point where I had no kind of leeway to actually eat what I wanted to eat because I didn't know what my body was like. I didn't know what my body needed. I was trying different things. So I tried different diets. I tried just eating six meals a day. I tried, okay, maybe drink more water, eating less carbs. And then I realized that that wasn't working for me. So going through that, I continue to keep going on that process, and I realized as well, going through practice, I would use my excuse of me being as tired in a practice to go and be able to purge right at practice, knowing that I would just have eaten food prior to practice, and I only ate the food just so, therefore, I can get it out of my system. So, therefore, I would feel better about myself. So that became to be a habitual realistic as well for me. But long throughout that time, I would have coaches tell me, oh, man, he's just tired at practice. My teammates would joke to me about it, but they didn't realize that it was me binging, more so thinking that I was tired. But I let that facade kind of stay around as well for as long as I could because I didn't want to feel embarrassed. I was a captain at the time. So you don't want to, you know, one ever wants to see as a captain as someone who is less of a leader or where the case may be. So I couldn't really let my teammates see it, not knowingly what I was actually doing the whole time. Let's pause right there. Being a leader, you don't want anyone to see you doubt yourself. And that is like systematic failure, because being a leader, the most powerful thing you can be is vulnerable and to admit your failures. And I just want to pause and and just give that moment some space because it's a real feeling. And so many of us 
whether it's in corporate life or, you know, as a parent or um, just an, an individual feel that we need to be perfect leaders. I think the greatest leaders from my, my experience and from my following have been the ones that have been able to look at themselves and see all the pieces of themselves, not just the perfect pieces and to hold, you know, to, to really digest that. No, thank you for that. Thank you. And, you know, that's, I think it's so it's so true when you say that. I believe that we all go through our own trial and tribulation. So, therefore, we can help someone else's testimony in a way. So, we lead by example. So, the things that happen to us, they, we learn from these lessons that we have gone through and be able to show someone else in a different light that, hey, this is what happened to me. Show them how to kind of cope and be able to create their own vision and journey. So, therefore, you don't have to go through these things alone anymore. Everything that I was going through throughout my collegiate career that led up to where I am today it happened through my sophomore year in college. Uh, seeds that were planted in my mindset about eating correctly, what an athlete is supposed to eat like, like quote unquote, um, those things were kind of embedded into my brain. And that's just the way that I kind of kept going about my day-to-day lives until I really realized what uh, eating correctly for my body was, how to eat for my body, how to actually kick back and not realize that I can have candy every once in a while. I can eat what I want to eat and enjoy myself. That's always been like a, big, a main focus of mine, just figuring out how, how can I keep progressing my way of life about eating healthy in a way. That's just always been me. I was speaking with one of my girlfriends yesterday about all the diets that we've done. And she was laughing and she's like, oh my God, I relate to that so much because I, there was one week where I literally ate only one color of food. So like Monday I ate reds, Tuesday I ate greens, you know, and, and she's like, it was supposed to be like a cleanse or like one genre of food. And she's like, I felt so bad. And I was like, and I bet, I bet you farted all day long. All day <laughs> she long. Was like, all day long. How did you know? <laughs> Diets don't work unless you have a metabolic disorder and that it's like a, a registered dietitian or doctor who's specializing in, in nutrition and that type of therapy, you know, something they prescribe, they don't work because, you know, they're out of, oftentimes out of the doubt and the lack and not the love mindset, because you could potentially have literally the same choices of food. Let's say, let's take keto, for example. One path is like, I'm going to eat keto. I'm going to eat this way. I'm going to force it. I am going to grasp this, only eat this, right? So it's out of fear and lack and scarcity and control. And then this other path is like, oh, I happen to be eating these foods because your body's desiring them. And yet it's a completely different experience, even though you're eating the same things because it's out of love and surrender and self-compassion and self-worth. Completely. It all boils down to what is your relationship with food like? Do you have a healthy relationship with it or does it a negative relationship? Meaning that if you're kind of, kind of, like I said, we're not registered. I'm not a registered dietitian myself. I'm a certified nutrition coach. But when it comes to being a registered dietitian, of course, you can be able to kind of give people meal plans. There's such a negative connotation around saying, I can only eat this one single type of way. And what happens is you're just not allowing your body, your gut to kind of diversify its gut microbiome, getting all the nutrition, the nutrients that it actually truly needs to kind of survive and thrive in a way. So I think when you kind of lack and limit yourself into eating only one central way, well, what about the other uh, nutrients that your body may need that you may not be getting from the vitamins that you may supplement with? There's so many different ways that you can go about it. Like I like to tell people, I believe in flexible living. I don't believe there's a thing called flexible dieting, but I don't believe in the terminology dieting. Flexible living means a day like this. So a simple week, I'll lay it out for you. A Monday through Friday. Monday, say I may eat uh, the traditional day being paleo. Tuesday, I may have a vegetarian day, meaning I eat no meat. So therefore, I can allow myself to kind of replenish myself with as much nutrients as possible. And just switching it up and rotating yourself throughout the week just, and seeing what feels best for your body. Does my energy feel better this morning that I wake up? Do I feel more bloated this morning? Do I, like, how do you feel? Think about that rather than more so, okay, well, these are the parameters that have been set for me and these were the ones I must follow. Yeah, well-being is all-encompassing. And I remember in, gosh, college, so I'm going to date myself. Weight Watchers is still very much a thing. When I was in college, it was a physical thing where you, you show up to a strip mall and you go inside of the actual store, Weight Watchers store, 
And the first thing they do is weigh you and you have a binder and you write down your weight as like accountability. And then you go into a meeting and then they talk about something and then you learn how to count points and do all this stuff. Well, I did this, right? This was the year after my massive injury. Maybe it was like, to me, it's not even linear. It was all just a shit show. I, in the same time, was in outpatient therapy for eating disorders. Just was like a lost soul when it came to nutrition and and understanding the connection of that physical body with like self-love, like through self-love. It was always through force and through um, unworthiness. And I remember counting food with points and I would take carrots because carrots were like no points or one point. And my roommate and I, we would do this. We would steam the carrots and then we would take them out and put Splenda on them already so disgusting. That's what we would eat during the day. Then I would be so hungry at night. I would sleepwalk into the pantry. I would take um, Ambien because I would be so hungry at night. I wanted to dose myself with a sleep medicine so I wouldn't get up and eat. And so hopefully I would be skinny and I would sleepwalk into the kitchen, into the pantry and eat an entire jar of peanut butter or like honey on peanut butter on top of a sandwich with sprinkles on it. I mean, like anything I could, you know, my body was starving and I just really lived the experience of so many of us, uh, you know, male or female. And that was like my, one of my college experiences. Another one was, um, be the first time I got weighed in as a college athlete Day one, strength training, you go in in front of the whole team and step on a scale and they read your number out loud to everyone. And like, come on, you just reduced me to a number. Wow. In front of everyone. In front of everyone. And I don't, and I don't think coaches realize that. But that like, that is a huge component because if your coach said it, all those teammates are your friends, teammates will inevitably come back and say it to you as well. And they will still continue to plant that seed into your brain as well. So it happens to be like a double trifecta in a way. Yeah. And wow. um, and then you compare yourself to everyone else's number. And then it becomes the whole thing because you're constant. You don't want to, you know, you know, they're going to weigh you at the end of the season or mid season. And then you're like, oh, my gosh, I got to control this. Even through my I'm 34, even through these decades, uh, I've struggled in various different ways, connecting with my body. And, you know, even as a model, I, even as a plus size model, I modeled at 16 different sizes. So just by saying that you can see that I've constantly been reducing myself to a size or a number my entire life. And I've never really stepped back to say, who am I if I, if I weren't a number, if I wasn't a size? Just who am I to to not be a number or a size? And then discovering that I am strong and letting that uh, manifest itself emotionally and physically, mentally and physically. And that's really where this conversation becomes important and becomes a tool because you've seen me going from like 10 pounders to 50 pounders to like, you know, doing like 80 pound RDLs and whatever. And I'm like challenging each other to to get stronger mentally and physically. I want so much to share this conversation with the world because we are all going through these reductionist ideas of who we are when in reality we're infinite and we're lovable and we're worthy of being loved and strong and not being reduced to a number or a size. That Those numbers can, and I think we realize that the things that kind of have stuck with us as a kid, whether it be us from high school athletics, or whatever the case may be, high school athletics, collegiate athletics, they've ultimately stuck with us to our age that we are today now. So once again, if you never deal with those skeletons that are kind of in your closet, then they will always be on your back in some way, shape, or form. So this is always about like a self-love appreciation, being able to take care of your mind, body, and soul as one synchronous unit. I don't care what age the case may be, what's your case, the goal is, feel good about yourself because if you can keep it going one day, it becomes habitual after a while. 
So if I can get you past those first month, two months, now it's become a bitch on the lifestyle for you. So I'm thankful that you guys have, have taken that on. That has been amazing. So we're going to continue to keep taking this just journey forward. Looking forward to it. That's one of the things that you've always preached to me. You're like, M, well-being and health is not a 30-day journey. It's not a crash diet. It's constantly showing up for yourself. And it's those little, little tiny choices every day and those little tiny decisions that are the ones that create lasting change. You know, you're so caught up on needing instant gratification. And there are so many marketing schemes that could entice us to think in 30 days, I can wear a bikini. My response always to that is, okay, what happens after those 30 days? Do you stop going or do you keep it flowing? Do you have to get ready for that next date for December that you're going to trip in? Or do you keep that same lifestyle, that attainable lifestyle, continuously keep it growing? So that's how I like to kind of respond back to those. You know, this is this is a journey. Now, it's a marathon, not a sprint. So I believe that once people can kind of flip that switch in their brain about, do I just want to look good for a vacation or do I want to look good for all of our vacations? How do we want to experience life and embody the experience of life as opposed to like, how do we want to look on the outside? How do you see what you do? Do you look at this as, a, as a, uh, an activity that I have to get done? Or is this going to be an activity that's going to make me a better person? Is it going to make me better for my kids? Is it going to make me better for my husband or my significant other when it comes to my wife? Am I going to have more energy for them? So it's a lot more that goes into the, like, the, the aspect of just, right, for myself. For myself, you know, and, and that's the main thing itself. Because if you can't take care of yourself, you can't take care of others. It's such a beautiful thing with just self-love together. And I, I think that the, the, the quicker that we can kind of come to a realization that this is important, that's when we all get better and we come, that we become servants for each other. Yeah. How would someone start, let's say like, you know, somebody's maybe not in such a dark place that we were in, but maybe they are. No judgment. We've been there. <laughs> How would they start to um, incorporate this self-love and strength into their lifestyle? Correct. So the best way that I would say to go about it is I can give you my experience. I can't say that they put a plan in place with someone out there. But the way that I went about it was the way that I found my passion for uh, fitness. Uh, I just kind of, let's say, locked myself into a into a gym. And I just started to kind of work out. Not really worry about, okay, am I losing weight or gaining weight? Um, not really worry about my energy, but just saying, okay, if there's anything I, I can do, anything I can control in my life, control how I feel about myself. I can control how I look and how I present myself on a day-to-day basis. So by me going into the gym, that started the foundation of becoming a better Jalen, like Jalen 1.0 or 2.0, whatever people want to call it. Start somewhere. If you can start with some kind of hobby, something that brings you joy, something that generates you energy, let that be the starting factor and that X factor that gets everything going. So for me, it was me going to the gym, showing up day one. Oof, I'm here. Okay. <laughs> Do I want to come back to day two again? All right. I'm here again for day two. And then once I found that, that was my source of energy and that was my gift of me giving to myself. And that made me feel good. I didn't care if it made anyone else feel better about themselves. It was more so for me. I didn't care about my scale. I didn't care about if I was losing weight, gaining weight. I didn't care about if I was eating more or not. It was just saying, okay, I'm going to pay homage to myself and do something for myself. Second came the food. So once you get your first stepping stone of just getting active, getting mobile, finding that source of joy that brings you life, that's number one. Number two, when you start to work on your nutrition, do not go in automatically off the back just saying, okay, I'm going to do this and a strict diet. Strict. I don't believe in that. Figure out what works best for yourself. And what I mean by that is, Try out different foods. Be okay with that. Be open to trying new things to see how your body responds to something. Like for Emily, like myself, example, I may not respond well to dairy because I'm lactose intolerant. So what am I not going to do? I'm not going to have dairy, you know? So fitness was number one. And I found out that I had a very good passion for, for cooking as well. So I was like, okay, well, at least if I'm going to feel good in a way, let me refill my body with the foods that make me feel good about myself. Now, number three, put them both together and you create your own lifestyle that's very habitual for you and continue to keep caring for it every single day in your life. Now, here's what's going to change. Throughout, as you continue to keep getting older and you continue to keep growing wiser about what you what works best for you, things will change. You may say, hey, I want to add yoga or more meditation there to become more one with my inner soul and mind and body. I tell all of my clients, please do more yoga. Meditate as much as possible. What you, where you want to be at, your brain is like your most powerful tool. Yeah, sometimes I feel like my brain is like a washing machine. I'm trying to like do physical exercise and I feel like my my limbs aren't attached to my body. But I show up 
for myself. And that is also strength. Even though things are crazy in this washing machine, I still value myself and I still love myself to say, I'm going to try and reappear for myself right now. Like really our, our exercise culture emphasizes that cardio is so important because we need to burn calories to lose weight and to stay skinny and thin. And what we've talked about is, you know, yeah, cardio is important for various reasons, but so is strength and, and, you know, balance and breath work and meditation and all of these other things that sometimes get overlooked. Like sometimes I would only do yoga, which is fine and great, but I would only do yoga because yoga practitioners had thin, lithe bodies, right? I had a yoga teacher, my yoga teacher, who taught me how to be a yoga teacher because I'm a certified yoga teacher, said that yoga feels better when you're skinny. Yoga feels better when you're skinny? What? That's crazy. And still body dysmorphia, even in yoga culture, the irony of well-being, come on. So anyway, you know, when I started working with you, we, we really started to discover that, you know, I haven't been doing as much running, which I'd love to run. I've run marathons, half marathons, all the stuff, love to run. Um, but I love to run for different reasons now. It's not about the calorie deficit or undernourishing my body. It's about the presence, the challenge, the attainable challenge, accessing flow state of mind, increasing my, my like my heart's well-being and getting my blood pumping and sweating profusely and detoxing. And so strength is so, so important to our physical and mental bodies. And we often overlook that. So I just wanted to bring that to light for all of the listeners because we focus on the calorie burn. The, the, the physical strength aspect is, is equally important. Correct. I agree with you so much. And I'm so glad that we're actually touching on this. Like I know that you and I, from our beginning, that we, uh, like I said, we're, we're both runners. You know, so we come from a running background in a way. So therefore, we always taught that uh, cardio was always the end all be all. If you didn't do cardio, then you're not going to lose any weight. Or it's not always just cardio that makes you lose weight. Cardio doesn't make you lose weight at all. It's kind of the same way as having a healthy relationship with food. You can have the same kind of relationship when it comes to cardio as well, because there's a thing is overdoing cardio. So the more that you can kind of revamp your mindset and actually understand, that, okay, let me take my cardio down. And let me just throw some sprints in there and realize that that's what's going to work a little bit better for you when it comes to that range. It's a game changer. It is a complete game changer in understanding what works best for your body. What do you recommend for someone who is going on a vacation or a trip and they don't have their trainer or a gym or, or even like maybe they're obsessed with exercising and has an exercise disorder um, and they really should take the time to enjoy their trip and be present. What kind of advice do you have for them to stay strong in their mind and body and not um, let the dysmorphia or disorders of exercise control the divine experiences unfolding and being gifted to them? So what I always recommend, not necessarily if you're getting ready for a trip or if you're even on a trip, understanding that you can always set a base minimum per day that I prescribe to people getting a minimum of 10,000 steps in per day, increasing your activity level. Whenever we go on vacation, we always, always, always hands down know that there's going to be food associated with that vacation, food and potentially drinking, right? So we always know that you're going to eat more than normal there. So if you can expend more calories without really realizing it, then you're, 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 it's great for you. So number one, uh, first thing in the morning, say if, you, you're, if you're on the, at the beach and your family likes to walk, Go for a 30-minute long to hour-long walk prior to your breakfast. One, you're already fasting. Uh, you're already in a fastest uh, rate of uh, your body at that time. So, therefore, you've already burned more calories to the, to the time that you went from sleep the previous night up until now. Now you walked an extra 30 minutes, so you're already in a best, much better caloric deficit. So, therefore, when you go into breakfast, you're not really consuming as much as you would have been prior to really doing that. All right, next step up here. Make sure that your activities with your family aren't really sedentary activities. And what I mean by that is if you have the chance to go through a safari or a zoo that requires you to walk or do something that actually makes you move your body, do them. Trick your body into moving without it really being moving, if you know what I mean. 
I'm with my family, I'm talking, but we're doing like adventurous activities. So it makes us very mobile and very, very active, I would just say. Do things with your family or you're by yourself. Walks. It could be yoga meditation, sunrise meditation, yoga. Uh, eating earlier before you go to sleep. Eating, at, say, around 7 o'clock instead of 11 o'clock at night. So your body doesn't feel as sluggish when you wake up the next morning. So it's just tricking your body while you're on vacation. What I'm hearing you say is, first and foremost, like, you know, pick activities that, you know, you can move with. Even if you're on the beach, you know, go for a walk on the beach. Or if you're in the mountains, go skiing or go hiking, um, go swimming, whatever it is, get out in nature. And even just getting out of the house, getting out of the hotel or wherever you're at and experiencing nature is powerful, not just about, it inspires me to move. Yes, you have to enjoy it. You have to, uh, don't get me wrong, you have to enjoy yourself. Like, even for myself, like, I may finish, I may eat a bowl of yogurt at 10 o'clock at night sometimes because I'm hungry. And that's completely normal. But guess what? The next morning, I know that I'm going to feel sluggish in some way, shape, or form. So I knew my consequences prior to them happening. But you can always kind of manipulate that time to see what works best for your body. But it's so important to just realize that, for one, you have to enjoy yourself. That's the main, main underlying factor. Enjoy yourself. But understanding what too much is enjoyment is and what too little enjoyment is. Find how much works best best for your body. That's the ultimate aspect of it. And in regards to circadian rhythm, and I don't expect every, everyone, don't get me wrong, we're all human. I don't expect anyone to be waking up, oh my goodness, I'm going to do a backflip now. But figure out what works for you. So if you need to go to bed at, night, at 8 o'clock at night and you need to be done eating by 6.30 to allow your, to your, to allow your food to completely digest, and so be it. That's just your body. The next person's body may not be the same way, but it's your journey. So realize what that, what that is and take it from there. Amen. Any last words? 1% is better than 0%. So any step is going to be better than you doing nothing. I tell everyone, do something. Try to do it. Uh, have friends. Great to have a support group around you who believe in you, who want you to succeed in doing the things that you need to do. Like, I never thought that we would have come to a relationship, not over the course of, what, seven, six months? But... I think when you come across great people, the world has a way of showing you to hold on to them. So when you see that, and when I saw that myself, that was, for me was like, oh, wow, they are really the real deal. So hold on to them, but also not hold on to them, pour into them unconditionally with love and care and nurturing. Learn new things from each other, because of course, we don't all know each everything. So we learn from each other every single day. You show me how to become one more with myself and think about things in a different way that I typically would not think about them. That for me is just, it's so eye-opening. I just had a conversation with Gabby Pissarilli about healing through connection. And that's a whole nother brave talk. But yeah, there's a lot of love that happens through that vulnerability of connection and seeing yourself in the other. Right. It's, just, it's, it's getting, I think in the course of, of course, during the pandemic as well, it's just, we're so uh, sectioned off from everyone. We don't really get any kind of human interaction. So I think when we've been lacking a component of our, of our day-to-day lives, that when you get it back, it's like, oh, I missed that. You know, you miss that communication. You miss that flow. You miss that energy. Ready for some rapid fire questions? Of course. Okay. Something most people don't know about you. Who I am. You may look at my Instagram and people think I'm very like the, the most like er and meanest person out there, but I'm very, I'm actually, but I have a nice personality. And once I open up to you, it's like, wow, I did not really know that you were like that. You're very like down to earth and very cool and, and you're very like quirky and, and dorky in a way. So that's me. And, and ellipses here. Something people don't know about you. Come on, Jalen. The one thing that my husband doesn't know about you, we must reveal in this episode. You give me it. Jalen likes fruity <laughs> drinks and, <laughs> and he does not drink whiskey. <laughs> I would not. I will I will not drink whiskey. I would not I would not drink whiskey or tequila unless it is any kind of sweet. It has to be a passion fruit type ordeal drink. No, I am a sweet drink type man. So thank you for bringing that out of the closet. There you go. Thank you, Emily. <laughs> uh can you describe strength in three words? Strength is being resilient, adaptable, and tenacious. Favorite meal growing up? A C 
seafood pasta that my mother would make for me in high school, it contained, it would have crack, king crab meat, it would have salmon, grilled shrimp, sautéed grilled shrimp with a little bit of garlic, minced garlic as well, and topped off with some, uh, with some pasta. And a side of sa- sautéed broccoli as well. Very good. Red or white sauce? White sauce. White sauce. I'm not a fa- I've never been a fan of tomato sauce for some reason. I could just never flow with it. I could never get jiggy with it. It just wasn't for me. <laughs> it just wasn't for me. Fill in the blank. Strength is? Strength is the ability to be able to do what others won't do. What do you want your legacy to be? Wow. My legacy. I want my legacy to be known as someone who, who served others and who was on this earth for other people who, who invested so much into themselves so therefore he could repay others through, the, through his knowledge in a way. And it was never really about him. Beautiful. Thank you so much, Jalen. Thank you so much for having me. It's been a blessing being here with you. Thank you. You can find Jalen Jones on social media at Jalen underscore Jones. J-A-A-L-E-N underscore Jones. So every month I create a newsletter that is something that has inspired me. And a couple months ago, there was a newsletter I wrote in response to Jalen and my conversation on strength. And I felt so inspired that I continued to wake up at 5 a.m. to write these things down. So I wanted to share them with you. Let me start off by saying I'm not a doctor or a registered dietitian, and I don't consider myself much of an influencer anymore with my decision to live a semi-private life. So what I'm about to say is just me making a human observation. Matt took Ollie for the day, so I spent some time doing something out of the, the pandemic norm, which was window shopping at an outdoor mall. I noticed that a major athleisure retailer changed their mannequins to include strong female sizes over a U.S. size 12. It was a beautiful sight to behold. I exhaled a little sigh of relief when I saw it. The store sent out a public message that I believe could not be louder these days. We should aim to be strong without focusing on size. Thought bubble. How many years have I exercised to get a size smaller, five pounds lighter, simply exercising out of guilt for indulging or imbibing too much the night before? Over the pandemic, I have seen and heard about too many people dying and getting sick, and my heart just breaks. It hurts. Friends with children getting diagnosed with cancer, a girlfriend experiencing ACL surgery with two children to take care of, with schools shut down, parents passing away, another friend coming out of chemo with four boys at home. There's just so much going on right now. And in the shit storm of what's going on, sometimes we find more meaning, purpose, or blessings. And sometimes we curse, kick up dirt, and fight. All the pain and death makes me have a whole new appreciation for my body. Over the pandemic, I've been lifting weights and focusing on my physical strength, and I'm almost stronger than my college softball days. I feel physically in union with my body. Alas, my love for health and well-being sometimes marries itself to my love of control. And then I find myself looking up things like best paleo books on Amazon, reading the reviews and thinking, I could lose five pounds this month too. As I accumulate more years of life, I have learned that good is better than perfect. While I was walking around shopping, I treated myself and bought this beautiful, cozy, sleeveless romper for all my home lounging, if it's still called lounging, while I'm chasing a toddler. When I got home, I tried on the romper and I thought about those mannequins in the athleisure store window I had passed earlier. I thought about how beautiful and empowering to see such diversity in women's strengths, notice how I didn't say sizes, represented in a window. I never used to prioritize strength. I never used to prioritize well-being. Even though I may have categorized my habits as such, to be honest, my priority was always size, even when I was a plus-size model. So when I stepped on the scale today, something I rarely do, wearing my new romper and feeling stronger than ever, I weighed more than I did before I started my strength training regimen pre-pandemic. And for a tiny second, I thought, shoot, all of that work and I gained weight. Maybe I need to do better with my diet. 
for a second, I scrolled back through Amazon searching for a book to guide me through a 30-day clean food reset. And then I looked at all the things I had to cut out of my diet in order to achieve that gold nutrition and weight loss and remembered that real life, the kind that I want to live, doesn't look like that. The life I want to live prioritizes good over perfect, strength over size, enjoying moments over control. And I'm sharing this message today because like most of us, you've probably had a lot of stress in your life, especially during the pandemic, whether it's financial, physical, emotional, relationships, you name it. To expect ourselves to be perfect, even for 30 days, even for one day, can add so much more stress to the equation. I would rather weigh an extra five pounds than sacrifice a glass of wine with my friend on FaceTime or with Matt, a slice of homemade bread with my son, farro and white beans in my soup, dark chocolate, fresh fruit from the trees outside, homemade birthday cake. And I just think that freedom to enjoy what we want is such a powerful, beautiful, liberating experience. Life can change in the blink of an eye. Enjoy the good moments, savor, be grateful, practice Epicureanism, pleasure as the highest good, and let the little things go. I often take for granted the days I feel strong and well, and I find myself fixating again on the things that culture and media has influenced me to believe I needed to fix. I've come to believe that those little fixations, as normal as they might seem for our culture, would be something I regretted at the end of my life. With my departure from much of comparisons on social media and new media, I found myself less influenced by people posting their perfect snapshots of life and the materialism that comes along with it. And I felt more inspired by connecting with real people in real life, on the street, walking around. Normal, beautiful, strong, resilient, badass women and men, unapologetic, positive, solution-oriented, honest, truthful, facing the hard stuff head on and confident enough to stop and celebrate themselves and their loved ones on the good days and on the tough days. How many good days do we have left? How many days do we have left? How many moments do we have left? Instead of seeing other women of all strengths, notice how I didn't say sizes again, in a window as beautiful and then questioning my own image because I might weigh more than I did pre-pandemic, I've decided to extend myself the same grace. I truly look and feel as lovely as those mannequins and as my friends in flesh. I feel strong and strong isn't always a size. It's also a mindset. If you're going through a tough time right now, pause and take three deep breaths. Take up space. Give yourself the grace to get through the pandemic and your life experiences feeling strong physically and mentally. And that courage and commitment to yourself might just inspire someone else who needs it. In the next episode of Brave Talks, I speak with Dr. Will Cole, a leading functional medicine expert specializing in the underlying factors of chronic disease. He's also Gwyneth Paltrow's functional medicine doctor. We'll be exploring how holistic care and love for the self play such a crucial part in the quality of our lives. What does self-love really mean? And how does it impact the way our bodies move through this world? Brave Talks is sponsored by Taja Collection Custom Candles. Taja Collection has designed a very special, really beautiful, amazing, Be Pretty Brave candle for all of you listeners who want to light up a beautiful message in your home or send it as a gift to those who could use bravery and courage in their lives. You can find the candle on tajacollection.com. That's T-A-J-A collection.com. And you can search for Be Pretty Brave and you'll find the candle there. Brave Talks is produced by Madeline Inskeep. Video production is by Wallace Cruz. The music is produced by my dear friend, Murray Hittery with Mind Travel. A heartfelt thanks to these three who support Brave Talks with their incredible talent and gifts. If you'd like to receive my monthly thoughts and a recap of this month's Brave Talks, 
head on over to emilynolan.com and click subscribe. Thanks for listening.